Okay, we're ready to go to begin our afternoon session. I hope you enjoyed the morning session with Rob Curley. As you're you know, well aware, uh, we're focusing then on covering social protest movements in an age of social media. And we'd like to begin with a local case that occurred about two miles from where you're sitting. It was the police killing of Kelly Thomas. We're going to look at how Ron Thomas, the father of Kelly, used social media to publicize his cause. And we're going to have Professor Jared Lovell of Cal State Fullerton talk a little bit about Please next for on police community relations. And then we have Gustavo Ariano of the Orange County Weekly. He happens to be the editor and author of several books. He was involved in a recent protest over the summer in Anaheim, California. And it's interesting because you've all heard of the Arab Spring, you've all heard of the Occupy movements. Now we are going to focus in on how individual citizens and local communities can use social media to publicize uh, causes that may not be covered in the mainstream press. Jared, you're going to begin? Yeah. So good afternoon. Hope we're all uh, nourished and awake and uh, ready. Um, by now we're all, do I need this? Is that, can we all hear if I go I'm trying to turn it down a little bit. Yeah, so it's, it's not so. Kind of distracting. Um, I think by now we're all familiar with the power of social media to spark social protest movements around uh, national or international issues, uh, whether it's corporate globalization and the WTO, whether it is Wall Street and the inequitable distribution of wealth whether it is oppressive regimes uh, and the lack of democracy in the Middle East. What this panel is gonna focus on is the ability of social media to spark protest movements at the local level. And politics really begins at the local level, and so I think it's really important to be able to hear, uh, not from an academic, but from two individuals who really made uh, local issues uh, become front page headlines and uh, to see how the story became not just one of a police killing, but it raised issues of uh, awareness of resources for the homeless. It became an issue about mental illness. It became an issue about police training. It was an issue that not only brought the end of a police chief and uh, not only brought the end of a life, unfortunately, brought the end of a, a composition of the city council and has uh, raised uh, planning for a police uh, citizen oversight committee. So you really see the power of social media uh, at the local level and uh, as Ron will point out, this local <laughs> story that took place, as we heard just miles from here, really became an international story. Um, and so, what I simply want to do is talk very briefly about the power of social media uh, on one particular issue, and that's police accountability. And we don't really have to look too far. I mean, we could simply look at today's OC register, see the front page, and see that it was because of a video clip that brought uh, an indictment against uh, an additional officer. Um, and. Uh, I had a chance to you know, get a crash course on the story and they said that it was a video clip of uh, the officer um, taking the first blow, I think, at the, at the knee um, that really brought about an indictment. We could look to the newspaper just two days ago and news that uh, the regents of the University of California had uh, come to a million dollar settlement against students at UC Davis. I'm sure by now we all remember the iconic image of, uh, I think it was Officer Pike was his name, who was uh, using pepper spray against the students. Uh, what was interesting is that without that video footage, it is doubtful, right? It is doubtful that the university would launch an independent investigation uh, with the uh, Kroll into uh, police practices, right? As a result of that video, I mean, let's face it, the students were not the most sympathetic people, right? And student issues do not really make it into the front pages anymore, unfortunately. Issues of homelessness and the mentally ill do not make headline news typically either. And yet because of that video clip, that YouTube video clip posted by so many students, the university launched 
uh, this independent report. And I've had a chance to read the report, and some of the findings of the report are just astounding. Um, among the most damaging conclusions was that the UC Davis police failed to act according to standard operating procedures, um, that the use of pepper spray was not authorized, and for me, one of the most shocking uh, conclusions, uh, the police, the UC Davis police, had no training in the use of that particular type of pepper spray. So what was interesting, what the report noted, is that the type of pepper spray that you're supposed to use at close range are those tiny little canisters that many women have in their purse, not those big gun kind of canisters that you're supposed to be a minimum of 20 or 30 or 40 feet away. I forget what the actual numbers are. But so you see on this video the cops using these big pepper spray canisters at close range, right? Without the video, none of that investigation would have taken place. The police practices wouldn't have been called into question. And campuses across the country wouldn't have been sensitized to the, to the issues of, of student protest. Uh, I think we could also speculate on the role of social media in holding police accountable through the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now, I, this isn't my area, and I may be way off, but it is my perception that the Occupy movement really didn't gain sympathy at first. I mean, I'm a big Daily Show fan, and I remember in the early days, Jon Stewart was, was really ridiculing the Occupy Wall Street movement. And then you had a video clip of two women being pepper sprayed uh, outside Zuccotti Park, and that went viral, and I think it suddenly raised a lot of eyebrows, right? <clears throat> Protest movements need a good martyr. You know, that's the reality. They need a good martyr. And you had those two women, you had, what was it, the 500 or 700 people arrested at, uh, uh, crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Suddenly people started paying attention, not only to the Occupy Wall Street protesters, but to the police crackdown. And we see that again, I think, um, in Oakland when uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement was kind of coming uh, to a close, at least in its, in its first phase. What's important for us to know, and I think what's important for journalists to know, is that police are aware of the power of media. And if there's one thing that I know is that they are very sensitized to it. I did lots of research interviewing cops, interviewing PIOs. I got a National Institute of Justice research grant uh, in 2000 where I traveled across the country looking at police PIOs. They know the power of media. They recognize that what police do is not as important as how it is perceived. And that's really important. So I spoke to officers who said that if there is someone nearby with a camera, they don't take down a suspect in the way they would if a camera isn't around, right? Because it's standard operating procedures for cops to put the knee behind the shoulder blades but that, or on the back of the neck, but that looks very, very damaging, right? And so as I tell my students in my policing class, right, the appearance of control is as important as control itself. And so social media have the ability to show police behaving in unrehearsed, right, unrehearsed fashion. Uh, I'll just make a couple of concluding comments and then hand it over so we could look specifically at the case study. Um, what my research has focused on over the years is the influence of new media on police behavior. And new media has historically been a, a source of police accountability and police reform. So in the early days of policing, you didn't have a paramilitary structure. You basically had the watchman style of police where an officer was given a beat and there was no direct oversight. And so police officers were connected to political machines, right? They were on the take during prohibition. They would guard uh, brothels and uh, gambling houses and so forth. With the rise of the steam press, you had the penny presses and you had the muckraking journalists that appealed to the working class. And there's no story that the working class likes more than stories about the indiscretions of the elite. And so as political machines were being reported on, the connection to local law enforcement came about. And that brought about a shift in police strategies and a paramilitary style police organization with direct oversight. What's important about that is to respond to this change in, in printing technology, 
police immediately made themselves available as news sources. And so to this day, one of the major sources of information at the local level comes from law enforcement who are more than happy to provide stories about crime to, to editors as news filler. And what's interesting about that is that it gives law enforcement near hegemony over the interpretation of crime and justice issues. During the early days of Hollywood, you saw law enforcement being ridiculed in the Keystone Cops on the one hand, and you saw gangsters being glamorized in cinema uh, on the other. The response was Hoover came about and did a total remake of the G-Man image to the point that you had Cagney going from playing a gangster to a G-Man in just a very short amount of time. The way Hoover did that was, again, he recognized the power of media to shape perceptions of law enforcement, and he handed uh, Hollywood case files from which they could write scripts. Of course, years later, you also had shows like Dragnet, which uh, were produced with the cooperation of Parker and the LAPD. When live television came about, that further threatened the image of law enforcement because live television, again, catches people unscripted. Uh, that brought about an end to the military style of policing, at least for the time, and uh, talk of so-called community policing. You then had George Holliday provide uh, local news channels with a video clip of the beating of Rodney King. In response, law enforcement decided to produce their own video clips and create shows like Cops, Real Stories of the Highway Patrol, and so forth. The point that I'm trying to make is that police are very aware of their media image. And new media technology can be a source of police reform and police accountability. What I find fascinating about social media is that all of those previous technologies that we talked about still require the presence of a gatekeeper. There's still someone who has to make the decision to release that information, to broadcast that information, or to print that information. With social media, we are the gatekeepers. And so how have police been responding to it? Terribly. Police have been arresting citizen journalists for photographing police, mm -hmm. right? Fortunately, the First Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that unconstitutional. And so my parting comment is, what do we do with this tool? How do we use it? How do we make sure that it continues to be a source for accountability without it being co-opted and rendered, you know, kind of managed by the very people that we are trying to, trying to challenge? Uh, so with that, I think it's important to take a look at how a local issue about the killing of Kelly Thomas became so many things to so many different people through the use of social media. And so I'll hand it over to Ron. Thank you. There's another chair over here if you'd like to sit down. So. Um, this started 14 months ago. My son was brutally beaten to death by the six Fullerton police officers um, down the street from here. I had no idea what to do. Even though I'm former law enforcement here from Orange County, I had no idea what to do. I, I've never uh, been involved with the media, per se. Um, nothing like this has ever happened. I was approached, let me back up. My daughter, she knew about Facebook. I had no clue what that meant. I didn't know what the word blog meant. I mean, that's how bad I was. But I got educated real quick, and I knew I had to do something. Uh, Local media out of Los Angeles, uh, ABC7, they came out. They were the only ones that were interested in the story. I did call them from the hospital the first morning. Uh, Eileen Frere, wonderful reporter, fantastic woman. She came out, did the story. Still nobody else would show up. <clears throat> Five days later, we had to take Kelly off of, off of everything. She came out again, nobody else would. I didn't know what to do. And some of the things I've done in my life, part of it is, uh, I've worked as a third party investigator in the construction field to investigate deaths from a safety professional standpoint and an investigator standpoint. <clears throat> Something inside told me to take pictures of him. So I did, I got out my cell phone and I started taking pictures of my son that very first morning. And that was the key. 
Yeah. Yeah, this is still a little emotional for me. There's a lot going on. Um, that was the key to do that. Still didn't know what I was going to do, but I had like nine pictures. So I'm looking on the internet, and I find this crazy guy going back and forth. Somebody told me, I think my daughter told me about this guy, his videotaping and posting it on YouTube, taking pictures of this camera, this city camera, and he's running back to where Kelly was killed and talking about the distance and this and that, and I go, who is this nut? I have to meet him. So I went down to where Kelly was killed, we call it Kelly's corner, and it is a, a memorial site. So I met with the man, his name is Tony Bashal, local developer in Fullerton, been around a long time, his family's been around a long time. He runs a blog, Friends of uh, Fullerton's future. Still had no clue who he was, this guy was acting like a nut doing all this stuff, because I had no idea what he wanted to do. He was putting it into his blog. After talking to him for some time, then I talked to one of his partners. I said, i got to show you this. So I did. I showed him the pictures, and they about fell down. Really. Pleaded and begged and tried to convince me. We had to release it in his blog. It's like, I don't want to release it in your blog. You know, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s. I don't even know what a blog is. Obviously, you can't get to Joe Public if I don't even know what it is. Yeah, I was a naive when I realized that now. Finally, I released the pictures to him. And uh, he chose the one, and that's the one viral. I still see that picture. Anyway, that was the start of it getting out there. And talking to Tony, the hits are coming in, man. Everybody's talking about this look, and he gave me the link to his blog, and I'm reading all this stuff, and I go, oh my God, people everywhere are talking about this. So what else can we do? My daughter sets me up on Facebook. Yeah, okay, whatever, honey. You know, um, of course I use the email. Uh, I put flyers on an email so people start giving information to me immediately, and they did. I, I had witnesses galore. I was turning over to the district attorney investigators, um, you know, and it just rolled. Just rolled. The information was coming in. Currently, still, uh, ones I haven't deleted, I still have about 2,000 emails just from Kelly's address alone. Tons of information that I turned over to the DA to help. On this, this blog thing and in the Facebook thing. So I get on there, she opens up an account for me on Facebook. Bam, hits. Like you can't believe. It. Maybe you folks can. But it, 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 people are coming in from all over the place. I gotta tell you, some of my biggest supporters are from Ireland, Germany, Japan right now. They always have been. So, not really understanding the whole concept of, of all of it. I knew I had tools I could use. I'm a very tactical person. Uh, I'm sure that comes from my military background. Very tactical person. I started giving assignments. I want you to contact Japan, find out who the major media is. I want you to get Germany, Australia, France. I went down the line. It worked. It worked. Kelly's story was sent out around the world. They sent, I think it's five or six different countries sent out um, documentary crews to fly to Fullerton, California to come here to do a story on Kelly. Japan, melting down after their tsunami and their nuclear disaster, met us down at Kelly's Corner. The last ones to be here were from Paris, France. That's how interested people all around the world are. But using the social media, giving assignments, getting it out there, continually contacting people. I use it all the time. And it was so key. And so what happened with all of that? People started getting involved, started coming out to the protest, started organizing the protest. I, I've never done that kind of thing, but I got on board real quick. Again, giving assignments. I may not know what I'm doing, 
but I know how to assign and delegate. And I've seen all these people out there with hearts of compassion and wanting to do something, and they were so angry and so mad, and I thought, I can really use this. And I did. One day, somebody asked me from the media, said, well, who are all these people? I don't know where it came from, but I said, they're Kelly's army. And that's how that started. <coughs> A huge step for me after that was developing relationships with the media. You have to understand how tired, how tired and numb I was. The first 30 days I lost 18 pounds. Go, go, go. I had to find out who the bad guys were here. When I found out it was police officers, I was floored. I didn't know what to do. It was go, go, go. So I started developing relationships with media. I was available 24 seven and they abused the hell out of me. But I didn't turn any interview down. And I say that in a good way. <coughs> I have a good relationship with the media. I was big brother by one particular media source, and he said, they're your friends now, Ron, but watch out one day they may turn on you, and I've never forgot that. When the story gets slow, it may not always be in your corner, and I appreciate those words. That's a whole different way to look at it, because some people out there just want the story. Some aren't so compassionate. Had major newscasters curl up in my chest and bawl like a baby. The same women had men do the same damn thing over this. The same women you and I'll turn the TV on and watch them in major news and just bawl and cry in my arms. Why do I stay so emotional? But if it wasn't for the media, my ability to get on board real quick and use them. And I told them, let's make no misunderstandings about our relationship. I know you're using me for the story, but I'm using you to get my son's story out. So as long as we both understand that, we'll always be able to work together, and it has worked terrifically together. Some of the media personnel, especially in radio, have been overwhelmingly supportive. John and Ken from KFI. Once those who lock onto a story, it's all over. It is all over. And they did. They actually came out and did a broadcast report over this story. And I call him the roving reporter, Steve Gregory. He's always there. So now, you know, we've got, I know you were touching on it earlier, the third officer, Joel Wolf, is now charged. And of course, two weeks ago, they cleared Kelly of everything. The chief of police did it. I wanted him to do it in a public forum, again, using media, so the world would understand. <laughs> Independent investigator Michael Dinoco came out and said it twice in his reports that Kelly did nothing wrong. I wanted it from the police department because the police department is the ones that said that he did. I put that doubt and that thought in everybody's mind that this guy was breaking in the cars, he was causing trouble, he was breaking officers' bones during this fight, all of this. And the chief came out and said he didn't do any of that. I was told by a large amount of professional people and attorneys, Ron, you're just not going to get that done. He can't do it, he won't do it. He did it. And so now, uh, I've been in many meetings with the district attorney, analyzing that film over and over. That's something you don't want to do, is watch your son die and get beat to death over and over and over. 